Looks like the sound isn't on. Raven, you can't hear the sound? I can't, can others? Okay, I'm seeing some head shakes. Okay. Okay, I'll re I'll start playing. Well, Dan, you're able to see the different ways that they're organized in our. No, it seemed to have gone out, but no worries. I can go ahead and do a, a quick voiceover. So what you're looking at now is the home page of curation. For this one on martial goddesses and mythical queens, you can see we've been able to not just collect a bunch of open access images, but also one of our writers has been able to add their own content and research to this collection, contextualizing it in their own research. We have some beautiful images here sourced from many of our partner institutions, and we can even search by more that haven't been added to this collection. So if we search for armor, we can even narrow that down further to say armor and women, for example. You can see the number of works, the number of collections, and the features that appear in that search. And we can also narrow further by metadata. So we can say bronze goddess, for example. I love this one. Really beautiful and comes from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, we're sourcing information and metadata directly from the Met. All of this information comes from the Met and please note that it's licensed under Creative Commons. And we can even add it to a collection. So users to our platform can log in with an account and create their own collections. So let's say Armor Goddesses for my new collection, add it here. And then if you go to my profile page, that's me. You can see my collections all appear here. These are things that I've collected from these open source collections. I've arranged, I've curated, and I can also toggle these collections to be public or private. Awesome, thanks, Sharon. So as I mentioned, this was a, a demo um, offered by our, our platform director, Amanda Figueroa. And so what she so beautifully showed is the ways in which as you start to search within the collection, you're able to see these, these objects alongside each other um, that exist in these siloed collections through these different museums and institutions. Um, and so curation is offering this ability to be able to see these objects alongside one another um, and start to tell a different and broader story, right? Or, or even more specific stories um, as we dig into the cultural narratives. And so I'm excited to pass the baton over um, to the rest of this panel as we start to dig into the rich metadata that really makes it possible for curationists to exist. Okay, thank you, Raven. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sharon Mizoda. I uh, use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm based uh, in on Tongva and Chumash lands in Southern California. I'm really excited to be a part of this panel and a part of this symposium. So I'd like to thank all of the organizers for putting together this amazing um, group of presentations. Uh, I am a metadata consultant uh, focusing on inclusive metadata. And um, I've been working on Curationist now for about two years. Uh, this is an overview of the nine different museums that we are currently pulling content from. Um, as you can see, the bulk of the content comes from the Smithsonian, uh, but there's a significant amount from the Rijksmuseum, from the Metropolitan Museum, the Statens Museum for Kunst, um, and that means that the platform also accommodates uh, multiple languages. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about our metadata schema. It's a custom schema, but it's based on VRA Core 4. Um, so as many of you probably know, uh, VRA Core 4 accommodates most of the, um, the basic museum fields that you use, title, agent, uh, location, cultural context. Um, it's modified in that we are able to you to have at least three layers of metadata for each item, um, that that could encompass multiple contributions. Um, so the idea is that 
metadata from the source institutions comes in unchanged and that forms kind of this bed of metadata right that's the the basic metadata that we're just sharing um, and that remains unchanged uh, and then there's a layer where curationist archivists can enhance records so this is adding subject terms or adding a different spelling or maybe a translated title um, and these are, are often added with a social justice lens, um, so things that maybe have been missing from metadata or that provide a different perspective on the object. And we'll have a few examples to share with you um, from our archivists in a few minutes. Um, I should also mention at this point that, uh, and I forgot to mention this on the previous slide, that all of these items that are coming in are in the public domain or are licensed Creative Commons Zero. So they are free to share and use. Um, and the metadata is, uh, although we're not editing it, we are adding to it. So the metadata is free to share as well. Um, and then what we uh, really wanted to do uh, in the, and this is on the roadmap for the future, is to open the platform up to community members so that people can log in, create a profile as Raven was talking about, but do more than search and uh, create collections, they can also add their own metadata to particular items. Um, and this is not similar to some of the crowdsourcing uh, uh, presentations we saw yesterday. Um, we would like to create a platform to do that. That isn't currently the case on the site. Um, the site is still in progress. And um, you will see, in some cases, multiple layers, but for the most part, you will just see the source institution metadata as the bulk of our records have not been enhanced or edited. Um, I shouldn't say edited, have not been enhanced by the curationist archivists. Um, and where that enhancement has happened um, on the current site, if you go to visit it, you will see the curationist layer. Um, and that has, for the time being, uh, replaced the source metadata. Um, and that's just a technological display issue that we're working out. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. If you do go and visit the site, um, you will see like a little C icon next to the metadata that has been added by curationist. That doesn't, if, if that's all you see, that doesn't mean that the metadata from the source institution is gone. It's still there. Um, it's just not currently being displayed. And that's an issue that, that we are still working on. Um, and so eventually uh, the platform will include contributions from community members. We'd also like it to be multilingual so that it can accommodate translations. Um, and then eventually down the road, if we, we, we develop our own API, we hope to be able to share back some of this metadata with the partner institutions if they would like to receive it. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the schema and the basic structure of, of the site. Uh, this is an example of how we designed the metadata schema. We're really taking advantage of VRA's use of um, attributes so that we can have many different uh, qualities or facets to each element, right? So we have the title. You can have an author that shows who's contributed that title. Uh, where it came from originally. Uh, so did it come from the source institution? Did it come from a curationist archivist? Or did it come from the a community member? The language of, that the title is in, so it could be a translation or a different language, um, whether or not that title is preferred. Uh, a, a ref ID to Wikidata, uh, if that title appears in Wikidata, and I'll talk about Wikidata in a minute. And then um, an SEO title, so a title that we might provide, the curationist archivist might provide um, to make the page, uh, you know, more, more easy to find uh, uh, through search engines. Um, so currently, all of the controlled terms that we're using on curationist that the curationist archivists are adding are sourced from Wikidata. And we decided to go with Wikidata as our controlled vocabulary source because uh, it is more up to date and more inclusive um, than Library of Congress or the Getty vocabularies. Uh, and because it is crowdsourced and editable, um, we could also make changes to it um, or we could add things. And I think to date we've added uh, over 30 new terms, mostly in the areas of indigenous cultures, uh, where there may have been a term on Wikidata for 
uh, the people uh, of an indigenous culture, there was no term for the, the culture, like describing um, the cultural context. Uh, so that's, so, so we have written um, taxonomy guidelines. These are guidelines for using Wikidata as a, as a controlled vocabulary within a social justice context. Um, and those are available online and I can share those links um, with the organizers uh, to share out at the end of the symposium. Uh, so, and that really is just providing guidelines on using, um, on how to use Wikidata, <laughs> but also uh, how to use terms and select terms and possibly edit terms um, to bring them more in line with language that uh, is respectful and accurate for various communities. And so this is just a screenshot of our, um, we have a kind of working taxonomy. Uh, so this is not meant to replace Wikidata. We do eventually want to have a full integration with Wikidata so that it can be, all the terms can be linked and managed by Wikidata and not by us, but that is currently not the case. And so when the curationist archivists are working um, to add terms, we have a spreadsheet, a um, good old spreadsheet, uh, that they can use to keep their use of terms consistent. Right. And so, but we're mapping all of our terms to Wikidata, including uh, Wikidata IDs, which aren't shown here. Um, and again, I just want to note that we are only adding terms uh, that we are actually using. So obviously this, you know, a North American cultural context taxonomy would be much bigger, uh, but this is what we've had to add uh, moving, you know, moving through the content that we've been working with, which is only a very minuscule number of records compared to the four million plus records that are currently on the site. Um, and so, as I've said, this is kind of an interim step, but this kind of helps keep us all on the same page in terms of what terms we're using and how those terms are mapping to Wikidata so that eventually we can we can have a full integration. And now I'm going to hand it over to Amanda, who's going to walk you through our first case study. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Acosta. I'm currently the digital archivist at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and I'm based in Baltimore, um, but I was the digital archivist uh, for the 2022 Critics of Color Residency at uh, Curationist. And so the record that I'm going to discuss today is actually one that was cut from an editorial piece by Colony Little who wrote on the wild woman of Aiken, um, and she was one of the residents. Um, so for that, I was providing uh, research and image support and through that process of working with the writers and researching, I think a lot of great language uh, kind of surfaced that really compelled me to continue cataloging it. So I'm sure as we all recognize, this is a jar by David Drake. And I chose this record to discuss today since recently there's been, if not a resurgence, definitely a surgence in fine arts and American art museums acquiring, acquiring works by David Drake. Um, so just a little bit of background on Drake. Uh, Drake was born into slavery under the control of Harvey Drake around 1801 in South Carolina's Edgefield district, uh, which is known for its rich clay deposits along the Savannah River. So owing to its natural resources and the abundance of enslaved artisans, that area boomed as a pottery district in the 19th century with over a dozen operating factories. Um, so potters or turners drew on British, West African, East Asian, and indigenous pottery practices, producing much of the earthenware that was brought and used throughout the region's plantations. Um, and Drake is a unique turner of the antebellum era. He's active between circa like the 1820s into the late 1860s, having passed away in the 1870s. And a lot of his surviving and collected works come from the Lewis Miles Stoneware Factory um, at the Stony Bluff Plantation. And under the ownership of Miles, Drake created massive up to 40 gallon glazed stoneware jugs and jars inscribed with his poetry, his signature and dated. Um, he also employed cross motifs. And this was at a time when black literacy was illegal. So therefore his prowess really cannot go unrecognized in his lifetime and his work has been collected and the subject of stylistic and literary, literary analysis, um, especially since the 90s. So it's not as though his work was in, undiscovered prior to the 2020s. It's just rather we're really seeing his work be acquired and displayed in the context of early American artists, as opposed to being set in separate or ethnographic narratives around enslaved artists. Um, and I guess if I may add an antidote to that, I actually had the pleasure of seeing one of these massive vessels at Crystal Bridges in Arkansas. 
and it is huge, but it is pristine. I'm, it looked beautiful, brand new, and it was on a podium. Um, there was no vitrine over it. So you could circumambulate the whole thing. And it was around other early American artists and sculptors as well. So thinking about this kind of new context in which it's being displayed in. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this jar is in the National Museum of American History's collection. And uh, let's go ahead and get into the metadata. So looking at the original source record, um, and this is the metadata that came along with it. Um, obviously the fields that immediately stuck out to me were the title and agent fields. Uh, however, the source description, which I didn't include here, did provide a lot of information, well, which also informed my choices. Um, and so originally I had chose to add the agent term David Drake. Um, and this is just because of all the shorthand of Dave, Dave the slave, Dave the potter, but in kind of preparing for this presentation and going back to the source records that are pictured on the next slide. Um, and those are from multiple sources for curationists. Can you click the next? Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's clear that he thought of himself as Dave within the context of his work. So I did want to honor that. So instead I chose uh, David Dave Drake employing those quotations for a nickname that is often done in uh, like BIAF records. Um, so we can move to the next slide. So um, all the text that's in that kind of aqua color are the pieces that I added. Um, so just kind of walking through those. So the source title, uh, which was jar made by Dave, um, didn't really tell us more than what was already available in other fields. So I did want to provide an alternative, more unique title. And I chose the first line of the poem that's inscribed on this jar. And the poem is, I made this jar all across. If you don't repent, you will be lost. And it's signed May 3rd, 1862, LM Dave. Um, and I made this choice in line with artists who use inscriptions as their title. So again, thinking about this object as a work of art. Now you could also retitle it um, to include the poem and then have a description like large jar with two handles if you wanted to go in that direction as well. Um, and based on occupation descriptions of the time and Drake's uh, record in the 1870 census, I also added the terms Potter and Turner into the agent role field. Um, for the date, I just included 19th century, again, just to expand it out a little bit further as far as what other things it can be linked with, um, and included Antebellum South. Um, so even though it kind of points to a location, obviously that's considered a time period and that's how it's classified in Wikidata. So again, trying to be able to work with Wikidata and see how they classify terms and how we can kind of integrate those into our terminologies. Um, as far as the location, so it gets a little repetitive, but I did wanna add a Lewis Miles Stoneware factory at Stony Bluff Plantation. And that phrasing actually comes from Art Institute of Chicago, who is another one of curationist sources. And I wanted to add that because I think it just adds a little bit more context that yes, these are skilled artisans working, but they are also on a plantation. They're also enslaved on this plantation. So I wanted to have kind of both of those realities represented. Um, the material, again, alkaline glaze, just make a little bit more specific. They already have the technique. Um, our cultural context, uh, again, that's used to name the culture, people, or country from work from which a work originates. So adding in African Americans, if you search Americans, they will also come up. Um, work type. Um, I added the word Kelowna wear, um, which I've also seen as Kelowna Indian wear. If there's like a more up-to-date term, I'd love to know it. Um, and the reason why I added that is because it points to a location, it points to materials, technique, and it gives you more about what the type of artisan. Um, so you're kind of getting all of that from this one term. Um, again, adding Edgefield pottery, and that's something that can be reused on our site. Um, across several of these examples and vessel. And then also subject wise, um, adding in poetry and I added in ceremonial object. And I believe it was from Colony's research um, that these jars were sometimes used as grave markers. And I think that's further evidenced by his inscriptions and poems like the one on this jar, which make reference to death and eternity. And I think the weight and path of the soul. Um, and other subjects that could be included, because there's always more subjects to be added, uh, could relate to its everyday function and labor and agriculture and other vessels bear inscriptions that wish their user abundance. So also thinking about conceptual terms that could be applied. Um, and so just to wrap up, 
I sourced a lot of these terms for my research and work with Colony Little, um, but as I stated before, I was also able to rely on the multiple source descriptions for Drake's works. Um, so it was really a matter of kind of teasing out and sorting those terms. So for museums that are revisiting their collection metadata, um, sometimes it really is as easy as kind of indexing the research that's already there, looking to your users and reapplying those terms in more succinct and accessible ways that will link objects across your collections in a new way. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass over to Christina Stone. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, I'm Christina Stone, and I've worked at many museums, libraries, and archives across the country. Uh, I worked at Curationist as a digital archivist from January to December of 2022. And now I'm currently at the Harvard Art Museums as a senior assistant registrar for collections. Um, so the poster that we'll see on the next slide was selected from an article on the journalist and activist Ida B. Wells. Um, so the article now on curationist Ida B. Wells, pioneering journalist and anti-lynching leader was written by Leah Gallant. Leah illustrates the values Wells fought for such as anti-segregation and anti-lynching in the late 19th to early 20th century. Ida was a pioneer in the time she lived, not only due to the color of her skin, but of a, because of her gender as well. She was discriminated against while riding as a passenger on the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railroad. She gained visibility after winning a lawsuit filed against the transportation company. She and other women from all backgrounds in the United States made progress to ensure equal rights for all. As a warning, the next slide contains outdated language. Next slide, please. Uh, so when looking at this image, Heroes of the Colored Race, we first see three very regal men who have been designated as those who defined progress in the area of social equality uh, at the same time as Wells. These men are Hiram Rhodes Revels, Frederick Douglass, and Blanche Kelso Bruce. We also see other smaller, carefully placed portraits of other men throughout the composition. Like in other images that I process, I initially identify the physical characteristics of the work before I search for contextual meaning which I pull from what the researcher has written or from other publicly available sources online. In this initial assessment, I can present terms and other metadata that provide a greater understanding of the work overall. I then turn to review the sources metadata to see where I can enhance what they've provided. In this case, I chose to do so in the subject and object description fields. Next slide, please. So um, as you see, I came across a beautifully and thoughtfully described subject headings that named all of the persons in the posters in, in addition to the roles they held in their life. I thought to myself, this is wonderful. And I'm able to learn about who is in the work because more often than not, we do not see this level of description. I also thought, wow, this is a lot, and it doesn't really show what's happening. Um, so I wanted to enhance the record by providing terms that perhaps would be used in searches outside of names and occupations. Um, next slide, please. So the four corners um, you know, scattered throughout the composition really offered more context in regard to major events that these heroes and everyday people were a part of. There's a battle scene, people in a cotton field, people fighting for equality and students being taught. I even see now a few things of what I added that I could change. Um, but my ultimate goal in choosing these subject headings were to provide more access points to help visitors in the right direction. Um, next slide, please. So um, seeing that the source record did not offer an object description, I thought this was also an excellent way to enhance the original metadata. 
I felt that I needed to offer a narrative that shed light to the women that, like Ida B. Wells, fought for social equality in America's history. So the object description reads as, um, four scenes illustrate significant contributions made by African Americans and surround portraits of prominent figures who fought for equality in United States history. These, sh these scenes show how African Americans labored, fought, learned, and were civically engaged in the 19th century. Though the prominent figures pictured here are of men, many women, including Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Maria W. Stewart, Henrietta Purvis, Harriet Fortin Purvis, Sarah Raymond, Mary Ann, Mary Ann Shad Carey, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony were among those who advanced civil rights for Americans. Um, so thanks so much for letting me share. Um, so we can move on to our discussion. Thanks. So uh, we did send out a solicitation to everyone to see if there were objects or that people might want in this uh, second half of our presentation because we really did want this to be like an interactive session, um, but um, nobody sent any. So <laughs> we came up with a few uh, that we thought would be interesting to discuss. Um, what we're showing here is the original source metadata um, for this cabinet from the Walters Art Museum, and I'll just go ahead and read it, um, and then maybe we can open up the discussion about this, to talk about this object or um, to talk about curationist in general. Um, so this is cabinet with Chinese and American motifs. It's Dutch after Peter Schenk, and you have to excuse my, excuse my pronunciation, um, Theodore de Bry and Paul Decker, the elder, 1700 to 1710, Baroque, wood, pine with paint and gilding, Baroque Europe. This cabinet was made by a Dutch craftsman to imitate the expensive lacquered Chinese and Japanese chests imported by the Dutch East India Company. The painter adapted some motifs, such as the pagodas on the drawer fronts from Chinese porcelains, but the figures are only Asian by virtue of their long embroidered coats with sashes. The headwear, including feather headdresses, is completely fanciful. Some figures are actually Native Americans adapted from engravings of 1584 reporting English explorations of Virginia. On the exterior side panels are remarkable adaptations of engravings recording a French expedition of 1564 to Florida. Young Floridians play competitive games while beautiful birds, imagine, imaginative renderings of the bird of paradise from the East Indies swoop around them. The maker surely hoped that his customers would just enjoy the exotic details. Um, so I think we've, we, we have our own ideas about what we could add to this record or to this description, but um, if people are willing, we'd love to hear from you either in the chat or by unmuting uh, what, you think, what you think could be enhanced about this description. And I think also a good place to start with that is thinking about what do you want to know more about this work? I think that's a good path to kind of lead you into finding new terms to apply. Okay, I'm seeing in the chat, motivation behind its creation from Tay. And from Corey, that last sentence is not great. I agree. <laughs> uh, yes, who owned or used this piece uh, from Kristen? Then from John, curious to know more about the works being imitated. Is this a straight up copy or are there other artists being implicitly cited? 
And Ashley writes, the different makers involved, did they work together or were they responsible for different media elements? Arden writes, what metadata and what search queries would get this to come up in the same search as Chinese and Native American resources so we could look at that context? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. And then from Beth, it's later history and provenance. Who is valuing this work over time? Yeah, um, I think there is some provenance information in this original uh, record, but we, just for space reasons, we're not able to include the entirety of the record here. So, of course, as a as a curationist archivist, that would be something that they would look at if it's available. I think yeah. these are. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think a lot of works like this were made for export um, to bring from, you know, the areas where the Dutch East India Company um, colonized and set up, you know, basically set up shop. Um, so they were meant to kind of entice, um, you know, mostly Northern European um, audiences. Um, so in the form of export where. Okay, I'm also seeing uh, from Lindsay, is there a type of Asian multi-drawered furniture this is based on and what was its intended purpose? So I think these are all really good questions so far. And um, I think already we've answered one in terms of uh, kind of what was the motivation, right? It's used as an export, whereas Christina said, so that could be a term that could be applied to possibly work type or a type of subject. Um, and I think maybe the next question, I think kind of what we and Christina and I would encounter is once we had these questions, now where do we go to find these answers? Um, so I guess maybe any thoughts towards that as well. Then from Beatrice, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, information about where the wood pine would have been possibly sourced from, as well as what kind of paint was used, thinking about trading of materials. I mean, I think this object is obviously evidence of global uh, movements, right? Um, and then there's also some power dynamics that are recorded in this object that are, would be interesting to look further into. Um, we talked about the Dutch East India Company. You know, that was a colonial company that was established to colonize um, Indonesia, or what is now Indonesia. So uh, this, I think this object, you know, we would, something that the curationist archivists might do, and Christina and Amanda chime in, is, is sort of, you know, refocus our lens on this a little bit away from these kind of like the quote unquote exotic details, right? Um, to look at more of the, re what, what you all are bringing out in these questions, like what are some of the, the reasons and the, the dynamics um, behind that? Okay, Beth has a question. I'm wondering if you can walk us through the process of researching answers to these questions and how long that can take before adding records to the site. That's a great question. Um, gosh, yeah, for some um, researching some of these objects, it can take, I don't know, up to you know, for this one, I could spend, you know, up to a day, you know, trying to find different publicly available sources. Um, and if I don't necessarily agree with um, what the source has written in the object description, you know, I do, I do further research on, um, you know, the subject matter, a lot to do with, um, at least for these, this one here, a lot to, 
um, research about the Dutch East Indian Company and what they traded and, you know, where they operated and kind of where the influence of like these, you know, new worlds, um, you know, have come into works, um, you know, that they wanted to sell. Um, so I think, you know, it could take anywhere up to, a, you know, a, at least a day to research and then compose my thoughts and then make sure I'm providing the accurate terms. Um, and then it, you know, it goes through sharing, you know, you know, different levels of, um, editing and then you know the the um development team they you know then push it through to get on the website um so i don't know it could take like a couple days i imagine um even longer i'm sure um yeah um and i guess if i can like add to that um it also depends how the records come to us, whether they're a part of a collection or like a longer essay. I find it easier and faster to kind of move through records that have uh, a writer has kind of fleshed them out more because then we're, again, that's where you're able to pull those terms from. Um, otherwise, I think I always return to the source records. I know somebody had asked about like provenance. So basically I would go back I see that this was owned by the Barra Foundation, so I could search them and see if they have anything available on that. Um, and that was a good point about publicly available resources, because if we're going to provide links to things, we want them to be like accessible. Um, and I think also looking at the records that this record may sit next to in the Walters collection and kind of maybe searching some of the terms or the artist in our other source institutions. Um, because usually sometimes, not all the time, you can find somebody that actually has a description related to that artist. So, um, and I know that's how a lot of our writers work as well. So it's really, again, trying to unite what is already there in these collections and just putting it all together. Um, and I think in terms of time frame, I mean, again, if it's coming with, uh, a lot of written material already it can take i think just maybe 30 minutes to like an hour to do like those extra like terms but as christina said the actual doing the object descriptions that can take some time that could be like you know a week working on one collection for sure and then i also want to highlight that you two have also added alt text and image description to a lot of these records. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, alt text is like one of my favorite, um, favorite fields to work in. It's, it's just, you know, providing, um, you know, a physical description of um, an object that, you know, so we can make it available to people with, um, you know, low vision concerns. Um, yeah, so it's just basically doing the physical assessment, um, you know, like I see a person here and there is a tree here, it is a cabinet, um, you know, it is gold, it is red. Um, I'm just trying to describe the, the object straight on without any kind of, um, contextual value um yeah yeah it, yeah it's my favorite it's my favorite field because it's just it's what it is it doesn't there's no agenda for alt text thank you um it looks like we have another question from john seems like this kind of piece drawing on multiple traditions correctly or not is prime for description using the connected concepts of wikidata can you show these connections through data links or do you find it more useful to build longer narrative descriptions? Um, I would say we would like to do both. Um, right now we're focusing on the narrative descriptions because that requires a lot less of a technical lift um, in terms of, of getting the, you know, like I said earlier, we really would like to be fully integrated with Wikidata and to be contributing terms to Wikidata and to have our terms linked to Wikidata um items but uh that's that's not uh that's not possible right now um it's not definitely on the roadmap um so yes our focus has been mostly on 
narrative descriptions, and then just adding subject terms that are all uh, linked to Wikidata. I mean, they're not literally linked right now, but they are. They have a source in Wikidata, right? So that eventually, um, when we are able to do that integration, uh, they will be able to be connected. And I think it's important to note too that a lot of the objects that the curation writers pick usually do not have any description. So in that instance, either they're writing the description or one of the archivists is writing the description. So we do want to kind of put um, information in a field which hasn't really been used so far. Uh, let's see, a question from Jessica. Do you have a Wikidata project created we do not. Um, I have been just adding, we haven't added that many terms uh, to Wikidata. A lot of the time we're just using terms or we're um, adding synonyms to terms. Um, so that has all just been done under my personal Wikidata account. Um, you know, eventually I would love to be able to have some kind of curationist identifier uh, property on Wikidata. I think it's property. I'm still learning Wikidata, but um, to be able to, like, I know that Getty and Library of Congress have their own sort of property where you can enter an ID, and it would be great to have to say, like, this term is used on curationist, right, and have that become part of Wikidata. Um, but that again, that's that's down the road. It it was a big uh, a big deal for us to be able to you know aggregate this content and to launch the site, and we are going to be working on refinements and enhancements um, moving forward technologically as well as in terms of metadata. Um, I think we have a question um, that was a little bit more general as well that I just want to bring back from before. Um, in your system, are you able to include the metadata as describing specific portions of the work or only the entire work? I'm thinking in terms of identifying individuals, etc. Yeah, it's only at the work level, the whole work. Um, we have talked about works like um, like sculptural works that have multiple different views um, and how we might be able to create metadata for, for multiple views of an object or possibly like there are certain objects that have photography that's been done over time, right? So you have very early black and white photographs or slides that were scanned and then you have more recent digital imagery of the object um, and how we might be able to account for that in our metadata, but we haven't, really gotten to that point where we can have like I guess multiple records for an item right or multiple facets of a record for an item um so that that's something I mean that's I'm I'm glad to have that question because maybe that's something that we need to put on our roadmap that isn't currently there um but it is it is something we've thought about it's just not something that we're actively uh developing at the moment And I see we have another question that's just come in. Um, this work is so exciting. How are you funded? Raven, do you want to take that one? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, it's a mixture of grants. We're also part of a larger foundation, the MHC Foundation. Um, so we receive a lot of support um, through them. But we have programs. Um, uh, Amanda mentioned the Critics of Color residency, which we're doing another uh, iteration of. And so we receive funding through different partners as well. And always looking for more. <laughs> Okay, um, we have another case study example, if you all would like to do that, or we can just open it up to general Q&A. Um, maybe I'll just forward to the next example and we can see what, what questions and what ideas come up about that. Um, so this work, just for a little bit of background, uh, it's coming from the Art Institute of Chicago, and this is the source data that was available that you see next to it, um, and it's included in a piece um, by Reina Gattuso, the Lauren Cortison in Edo, Japan. Um, so it has already been uh, 
enhanced or added to, but just curious to know um, maybe other people's ideas. Um, this source record didn't come with any subjects. So even just kind of off the top, just from a quick look, what are some kind of terms that could be added maybe? Or as we said, if we wanna just talk about curationists as a whole. Okay, Tay says, definitely interested in provenance and the market it was created for. Do we know anything about that, Amanda? Hold on, let me check. It was part of a Clarence Buckingham collection. Um, at the time though, and again, this is kind of based on the writer. Uh, so I guess I give some away about the object, um, but these prints were really used to kind of display the talents of these courtesans. Um, these courtesans were essentially uh, culture makers um, as far as either painters or poets or performers. Um, so I think a lot of the times these kind of woodblock, woodblock prints would be used to kind of promote their services, which again, ranged. A question an object like this raises for me is, um, since it's part of a series of 12, um, how you sort of might think about uh, separate data records of separate objects speaking to one another. Um, that has definitely been a thought. How do we kind of link these on the curationist back end? Um, so there is a field for it. Um, but again, I just don't think it's been completely worked out just yet. But ideally, we would, again, continue to kind of catalog them as separate records, but have kind of hopefully in the future some type of overarching link that will put them all together. I, I muted myself. I can imagine from sort of a user perspective, that would be really great, especially if a collection, say, only has one of a series, and then to be able to link across collections to reunite the series with um, sort of the, all those different images. And I see we have more questions also coming in in the chat. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Arden says, would you would be interesting to relate this to actual screens like the one being painted or actual kimonos like the ones being worn? Yes, I agree. That's that's a great point. And then the title describes it as a picture of a courtesan linking it to sex work and erotica, but it shows two women creating art, one painting and the other grinding or mixing pigment. How can we give a better description of what is actually depicted here? Yes, that is exactly what curationist is for. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was from Ann 